Being part of a mastermind has its innate benefits, one of which is gaining perspective from thought leaders in various industries. In today's episode of the Tech Leaders Playbook, we've done just that. We've put together a mastermind episode taking a handful of the best insights. This episode is jam-packed with valuable information you'll be able to apply immediately. Let's dive in. For those that think AI has been around for a year or two, because that's as long as chat GPT has been out, you were doing AI 20 something years ago. I mean, that's in a way, right? Very simple, but basic bots and, and uh, automation scripts and things like that. You were you had created this many, many years ago. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I, I liken it more to actually the sort of web crawl experience or like almost a deep web crawl more than the AI side. But I have been doing a lot of AI for a long time. And I love your comment. Uh, people do think AI is a new thing because of ChatGPT and you know the mid journeys of the world, etc., coming out. Uh, but it, it, it's really interesting. Um, I still think all of that is really just statistics. Um, so it's like if you've been doing statistics, it's not a leap to get yourself into the AI, AI world. It's basically all stats. So it's applied stats. It's interesting. Um, but I, I don't hear a lot of people recognize how how long the AI field's actually been around. I think the world will explode if I don't ask CTO about about uh, current trends specifically in AI. So let's let's get into that. How do you how do you kind of keep up with current trends? And the current trend seems to be AI. AI is clearly changing the world. You and I knew that ten years ago, all right? It's just it's just taking off ten x. We didn't know it exactly in this way. <laughs> I, I think it's fair to say. <laughs> of course not. At the time, I think you all were a very data-driven uh, culture, um, and so obviously that bleeds into AI. But tell me a little bit about what, what you're seeing that's happening and what some of your predictions will be for the next five years. The first thing I would say is be really suspicious of anybody out there who's making predictions about where AI is going. Um, last year, was it in November that ChatGPT was released to the public? It was sometime around that anyway, in the fall of last year. And... Um, OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT, they created it internally. They didn't know what to do with it. They didn't, they didn't know there was any business there. And they kind of shrugged their shoulders and they were like, well, let's just release it to the public and you know, whatever, and we'll move on. So, you know, if anybody was able to predict where AI was going, I would point my finger at those guys, right? They were at the forefront of, of what we're all reacting to now. And they couldn't quite see where, where this was all going. So you know, if they can't, I think a lot of the pundits that are out there, they're going to, they, they, you know, we're, we're all figuring this out as we go. Um, that said, um, I think there is only one option for us in the, you know, in the near future, which is we should be leaning into this technology, just looking at how this is affecting software engineering, my, my immediate domain. It is a, the, the tools that exist today are already clear productivity boosters. Companies that are properly using the chat GPT and the tools based on, the, on those technologies that are already available to engineers like Copilot and other tools, um, that is already easily a 20% productivity boost per engineer. And you know, look at tools like Copilot, they cost 20 bucks a month. They're so cheap um, that we need to be leaning into that. If you're not leaning, leaning into that, then you are going to get left behind. Um, I do think it is critical for the philosophers of the world and politicians and others to think about where this stuff is going. Um, you know, the existential threats and the Terminator types of conversations where people talk, talk about a, a future run by AI is, um, those are important conversations to have, but if we react to what's available today by saying, you know, by introducing restrictions on how we use today's generation of technology uh, for productivity boosts, we will we will fall behind relative to other countries that do not have do not make those same decisions. Um, this is a huge, huge productivity boost. Um, you know, I was listening to an interview with uh, Jeffrey Hinton recently. Um, who is kind of like, you know, some people say the godfather of, of generative AI, but, you know, he's certainly been working with generative AI probably longer than anyone. And he's, you know, he recently left Google um, and he's been raising concerns about where this stuff is going. And um, 
he's describing the current generation of tools as an idiot savant, right? Um, and I think that's a pretty good label. Um, the generative AI technologies that exist today are really, really bad, like really impressively bad at giving you truth, right? So don't trust the, the generative AI systems to generate truth for you. Um, you know, some lawyer, some lazy lawyer out there found out the hardware, I think, and let, gener let ChatGPT generate his legal arguments for him and, and How got did in that trouble. Work out? Yeah, it didn't, it didn't work out too well uh, <laughs> because, you know, it created all kinds of, it cited all kinds of previous cases that didn't exist and they were just, it was just riddled with lies. So if you're, if you're relying on, if you think ChatGPT is going to be, allow you to sit back and turn off your brain, you're very mistaken. In this, this generation of tools, you're very mistaken. And, and that's going to be this, the case for a while. ChatGPT 4.5 or whatever the next version will be is not going to suddenly fix that. There's, there's an architectural aspect uh, to this and figuring out what truth is, is a very, very hard problem. Um, so that's not something that's going to change. I'm not going to say five years. I don't. I I wouldn't dare make a prediction that is as far out as five years from now in this rapidly moving space. But um, certainly over the next, I'd say, you know, eighteen months, this is this is not um, what you want to use ChatGPT for. However, there are a lot of tasks in I think pretty much every domain, but certainly in my domain, in software engineering, there are a lot of tasks that are more humdrum than others. If I'm creating, if I'm creating a piece of software, um, if I'm following good programming practices and I'm uh, creating you know, compact individual pieces of code, like I've got, a, I've got a software interface and I've got a little class that's powering that interface, I can show that to tools like ChatGPT and say, hey, create the unit tests for me, right? Sure. Um, in modern, I mean, Hopefully, everybody is creating unit tests for their, their code these days. Um, ChatGPT is not going to be a replacement for your brain. When you want to create some clever tests, you probably have to roll up your sleeves a bit still. But 80% of the tests that you're creating when you're creating unit tests are very straightforward. And that's an, just an example of ChatGPT can blast out a lot of tests for you. Um, tools are coming along. I've spoken to a number of people who are working on these tools that are going to tell you very soon where your security vulnerabilities are in your code, right? You know, there's there, there's there's the OWASP top 10, which is the the top 10 most common coding patterns, you know, essentially bugs in your code that allow hackers access to your stack, right? Uh, you know, avenues to it uh, to uh, enter your platform. And um, if if I could somehow have a tool tell me, look, this is where all your OWASP top, top 10 vulnerabilities are in your code. That would be incredible, you know, to be able to, you know, and this is even before you have a robot that can say, go fix them for me. But if I could just, if a team could just point themselves and say, oh, look, there's three OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities we didn't know we had, let's go fix them now. That would be incredible. And um, that's a productivity boost. It's also a... Um, happiness boost for it's, people well, it's a happiness doing this boost, kind of stuff. But you, you can imagine the productivity uh loss you get when when you don't fix those problems and you get a nasty hack a year later or nine months later or whatever where some attackers get into your platform your business suffers um by the way if the attack is bad enough your business gets destroyed overnight there's I, I would rather have my data center blow up than have a really bad hack of my platform because you've lost all trust with your users when that happens and it's very hard to recover from that. What are the challenges and promises of the AI revolution in helping in the data technology world? Like, what, what's one that you're you're seeing as serious and and something that that could make an impact? There's one that's actually very very serious that um, probably already is making an impact in a bad way, which is you know it used to be that when you get that phishing email, it was pretty easy to tell that it was a phishing email, and I think that's going to continue to get more and more difficult as you find the bad actors start using AI to improve their ability to coerce you into doing something that you ought not do. So I'm I'm nervous in that area. Um, that includes, you know, I see these things all the time where people will send us emails, oh, please pay this bill, transfer money over here, you know, can you just forward that to accounts payable? And you're like, what? Like, this isn't even from us. <laughs> I mean, come on. Well, we get that daily. 
We get that daily. People pretending they're me, asking people to send phone numbers so then oh, yeah. they can start saying, hey, do you mind? I'm in a meeting. I need you to buy two, two uh, Amazon gift certificates, $500 each, please. We could talk later. People have fallen for it. No oh, joke. Yeah. No, I know. I know. Um, people it's a big are, deal. I mean, I was on the phone with Amazon making sure my employee got their refund. I mean, it was, it was insane. Yeah. No, I, trust me. I, I see this stuff also all the time. Um, that I think is going to get more and more difficult in a big part of the problem there. When you go back and you look at again, the internet and it's, you know, creation and even I'll even call it the web as we know it today, less, less internet. There's not a whole lot of like security built into it. And so people keep throwing in layers of security, but the one that doesn't really seem to have figured it out is email, right? Email, uh, I think it's RFC 822 came out in I don't know, 1982, 1983, something like this. There's, nothing built in there really for security, right? And so people, again, they keep layering stuff on top of it, but that's still a pretty big problem. Uh, just identity is actually a big problem. Are you actually who you claim to be, right? I've got an email that says you're wow. somebody, or I get a text that says you're somebody, are you actually that person? That's a really big problem. And I think AI is gonna actually make that easier for bad actors to trick people into thinking it is correct because now you can have a discussion with them. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about, right? Maybe it's the you know, hey, your Netflix account's going to be canceled. You got to click this link and pay. You're like, uh, if you, you know, if you don't know what that is, you're like, no, I think I paid it. Oh, no, it shows here on, you know, account, blah, 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 date, blah, blah, blah. You still owe, blah, blah, blah. You must pay now, right? You can start interacting with them and you may get a more convincing, realistic response back that could confuse you or cause you to do something that you ought not do. Kevin, you've been great, man. Any, any, uh, any thoughts you can leave us with? Um for the next time? Yeah, well, you know, the world's a big place. We got a lot of, a lot of interesting technologies that are coming out. Uh, you know, AI, uh, again, to your point earlier, everybody's seen the chat GPTs of the world. We've done some interesting experiments there uh, in the marketing space to see how that goes. Um, some of them are good, some of them are bad. I don't think it's quite the panacea that everybody seems to think that it is, but, uh, you know, I think there's gonna be a lot of additional developments there and it's gonna continue to improve. The most important part of that is, do you have, again, enough data in your first party data warehouse that allows you to use those technologies and actually get some value out of them? Or do you have to rely on you know somebody else to do that? So I think we're gonna see a lot more of that, especially as, again, we get closer to the, the cookie death. Um, again, I think it just puts more reliance on those first party data holders um, to really understand what they're doing. And I think you're gonna see, see a, lot more, a lot more of that type of activity. Companies are dealing with a lot of challenges uh, as as many great discipline focus that people that are out there that work really hard remotely. Um, there are as many stories of folks quite quitting, not working. People haven't turned on their computers in three, four weeks and so on and so forth. That combined with people don't want to work in an office. Salaries are highest ever, even in, in the layoffs. And companies are reacting to that by having massive layoffs. It's a correction, right? They overhired, overpaid. Six out of 10 companies said said they will have a layoff or have had a layoff in 2023. Combined 2023 and 2022, we've had you know quarter million of layoffs just in the US from just big tech companies. If It might be more than that by now. So companies want efficiency uh, financially and from what they produce out there. And on the flip side, most of the folks want to work less and live, live more, right? Um, how are we going to balance as leaders? How are we going to balance the needs of people and working and to employ people? And there's young and upcoming computer scientists that are graduating and may not be needed. I'm guessing manual QA engineers are no longer needed, right? Um, automation engineers soon could be not as needed. So how do you deal with, how do you balance both sides? You, If you don't go with the flow and go and, and, and utilize AI, you're going to be a dinosaur and die off. If you're full on with it, we already know what's going to happen. How do you deal with those two things? And I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I do think that companies are going to become much more productive with their teams, which is great. But does that mean there's going to be lots of layoffs? Will some companies lay off engineers? Yes. But how will that balance out? Will that mean there's going to be a lower demand for engineers as we go forward? My suspicion is that the answer to that is no. There is going to be more opportunity. This technology, I think, is going to create more opportunities for more for engineering in more places, software engineering in more places. Um, by lowering the barrier to entry to software, as you just said, Avidas, 
software engineering is more expensive than it ever has been. The market is telling us that there is demand for this. Yes, if you're one of the uh, you know engineers who is out of a job right now, it sucks right now. I don't mean to make light of that. Um, I don't think it sucks as bad as it did in 2008, mind you. This is this is something that is going to correct. When you look at the the recruit recruiting numbers over the last three years, the amount of engineers that were recruited into the big tech companies, so far, when I look at layoff numbers, it feels like we are correcting rather than going into sort of recessionary layoffs. Um, yes, it's awful if you are if you are one of the people affected, um, but I I do think that there's still uh, active hiring. It's taking longer. If you're looking for a job today, it's going to take you longer than it would have taken a couple of years ago. Sure. Um, but I do think the market is telling us there's still tons of demand for engineers. There is. Um, and we're busy. I mean, there's there's plenty of hiring, not as much as last year, but there's still plenty of hiring going on. And I think uh, one thing that is going to be true that as productivity of individual engineers goes up, I don't think that's going to mean that engineers are suddenly going to be making half the amount of money they were making before because my experience so far with the the generative tools is that you need to have a pretty good engineering brain to pilot that those tools correctly you, these tools will not make a sketchy engineer into a great engineer what these tools will they'll make a solid engineer into a much more productive engineer but you need to be a solid engineer you need to be reviewing everything that's cre gets created you need to be um you know interacting with the tooling in such a way steering it correctly in order to get to that right output so it, it's an accelerator it's not a replacement for your knowledge though um i believe that's going to remain to be the case for a while I, again, I'm not going to say five years from now it definitely will be this or that, but certain, I, I think three years three years is a horizon I'm comfortable with, and I think in the next three years it's not going to it's not it's not going to be that replacement. I, I I'd like to be standing you know at the cliff three years from now and looking at the next three years looks like, um, but but what exists today I think is going to be an accelerator and it's going to enable a number of organizations that currently look at the complexity and the cost of having a software operation, and they're saying, no, thank you. I think this tooling is going to create more flexibility for organizations to say, maybe, you know what? I think we, if we can do it at half the price we thought we could do it at, let's, let's lean in and let's do it. So I'm excited. I think, I think there's going to be a little bit of a, an explosion of um, opportunities for engineers, actually. And that brings us to the end of another great episode of the Tech Leaders Playbook. I want to thank you for joining us and hope you took away some valuable insights to apply in your professional journey. Don't forget to subscribe on your preferred podcast platform so you don't miss out on the next great conversation. I promise it'll be good. If you enjoyed today's episode, we'd appreciate it if you could leave us a review. Your feedback not only helps us improve, but also help others discover the podcast. Better leaders mean better working environments. Better working environments leads to happier people. Remember, a rising tide lifts all boats. I'm Avita Santoplian, and this has been the Tech Leaders Playbook. Keep leading, keep learning, keep giving, and I'll see you on the next one. Until then, stay inspired, my friends.